Hi friends, thank you for taking time out of your week to spend a little with me. I appreciate you. This week I'm picking back up on viewer suggestions, and this suggestion comes from Casey, so thank you in advance. We're going to discuss the kidnapping of Dorothy Lewis and her two daughters in Eustis, Florida. As always, I invite you to join me as we remember Jasmine and Jamelia Lewis and recognize the bravery of their mother, Dorothy. The city of Eustis, Florida is part of the Orlando and Kissimmee metropolitan area. The total area of Eustis is around 9.6 square miles and boasts a population a little over 23,000 residents. And in 1993, it was the home of the Lewis family. Dorothy Lewis grew up in the area and was very active in her church, the Church of the Living God. Her mother played piano here and eventually, Dorothy would marry here as well. Dorothy met James and the two fell in love. They went on to have two daughters together, Jamelia and Jasmine. Jamelia, who attended Eustis Heights Elementary, was an honors student and described as detail-oriented. In Dorothy's own words, Jamelia was her prissy child and was only interested in girly things. If she saw a bug, she would yell out how gross it was, while Jasmine was the complete opposite. Jasmine wasn't interested in dress-up, and that same bug Jamelia was scared of intrigued her sister. Sadly, tragedy struck on Christmas Day of 1989. James died unexpectedly of meningitis, leaving Dorothy a widow and a single mother to two young children. But with the support of her family and community, Dorothy was able to push on. On January 30th, 1993, Dorothy realized late into the evening that she promised to bring a dish to church the next day. She planned to make her strawberry pretzel salad, a crowd favorite amongst the congregation. The only problem, though, was she didn't have the ingredients on hand. So she loaded her girls into the back of her 1989 Chrysler Fifth Avenue. The Lewises arrived at their local Winn-Dixie around 10 p.m. Dorothy recalled seeing several people sitting outside of the store by the doors, but didn't feel threatened by their presence. After collecting the necessary things, she and her children left the store and headed back to the vehicle. She placed the girls in the front seat before walking around the back of the car to enter the driver's side. However, before she could reach the door, a teenager approached her yelling at her to stop before exposing a gun tucked away in his waistband. Dorothy, who was fearful of her and her daughter's safety, obeyed the young man's request. The teenager forced Dorothy and her girls into the back seat before calling out to another man who was waiting on a nearby sidewalk. He yelled out, hey, come on, we got one. The man, 18-year-old Richard Henyard, joined his accomplice, 14-year-old Alfonso Smalls, and the two drove off with the frightened Lewis family. Dorothy's girls cried. They knew something was wrong, and Dorothy started to plot, trying to come up with a solution to protect them and get them out of the situation. The only plan she could come up with was to jump out when the car slowed enough. She even let Jamelia know that when she said to jump, go, and Jamelia replied, okay. These were the last words her mother would hear from her. Henyard drove Dorothy's car miles away based on directions provided by Smalls. Her girls, who could not stop crying, caused threats from Smalls. Smalls told Dorothy she had better shut them up or else. Dorothy quietly prayed, hoping for kindness, but Henyard quickly put her down, stating, You might as well stop calling Jesus. This ain't Jesus. This is Satan. She pled with her captors to let her girls go. She didn't care what they did to her. However, they stated they couldn't do that. After driving for several miles, Henyard eventually stopped the car, pulling off on the side of an isolated, unlit road. Dorothy was forced out of the car and placed on the trunk. Henyard started to assault her. She begged him not to do it in front of her kids, but he didn't listen. After Henyard, Smalls repeated the same horrific actions. During her assault, the gun was placed on the car, and Dorothy saw an opportunity. She attempted to disarm them, but when Henyard saw her reaching for the gun, he picked it up quickly. She was forced to get on the ground by Henyard, but when she hesitated to follow his order, he pushed her down then shot her in the leg. 
followed by three more shots hitting her in the neck, the mouth, and between her eyes with a 22 caliber gun. The assailants rolled Dorothy's body off the side of the road into a patch of grass before driving off. Jasmine and Jamelia watched through the rear window of the car as their mother grew smaller and smaller, driving in the opposite direction from her. Their cries grew harder and pleased with their captors to bring back their mommy. They barely drove a mile up the road before stopping the car again, this time pulling the girls out of the back seat. They led the girls to the grassy area on the side of the road, where they were each shot one time in the head. They took the girls' bodies further away from the road, discarding them over a fence into some underbrush before driving away. Henyard and Smalls then drove Dorothy's car to 16-year-old Manuel Yon's house, where they planned to go to a club in Orlando. Yon provided both suspects with a change of clothes due to theirs being stained with what appeared to be blood. Jan also agreed to conceal Henyard's gun in his bedroom for the time being. The group were not in the car long before Henyard told Jan he shot someone. After their night out, Jan was taken back to his home, while Henyard and Smalls discarded the vehicle and went their separate ways. It's unsure of how much time passed, but miraculously, Dorothy Lewis survived the attack. She woke up where the two left her. She struggled to her feet and started to stagger along the road, hoping to find her girls. Dorothy recalled hiding from headlights of passing cars, fearful that the boys were coming back to finish the job. She walked for nearly a mile before finding a house where help was called. She explained to the homeowners they still had her girls, before she fell unconscious again before police could arrive. The next morning, Dorothy woke up at the Orlando Regional Medical Center in Orlando, Florida, to the sound of her sister's voice. Dorothy had a hard time comprehending if this was all real, asking her sister if she was dreaming, to which she replied no. Then she asked about her babies, and her sister just said no. Dorothy Lewis learned three hours after she was rescued, the bodies of Jamelia and Jasmine were discovered. Dorothy described at the time she just felt so numb. She had no feelings. She wanted to cry, she wanted to scream, but she just couldn't. Dorothy's recovery from her injuries included four metal plates and two screws in her head. She lost her sense of smell and taste. A dentist in Mount Dora, Florida donated dental work to help rebuild her teeth. Her physical wounds were healed, but psychologically, Dorothy lived in fear. Meanwhile, her attackers were completely unaware that a loose end remained. Henyard performed normal tasks as if he didn't commit a series of heinous crimes. The following day, Sunday, January 31, 1993, around 9 a.m., Henyard and his aunt, Linda Miller, met her friend, Annie Neal, at a laundromat to wash clothes. This laundromat was located next to the Winn-Dixie where he just kidnapped a family. Henyard waited at the laundromat while his aunt and her friend went to the Winn-Dixie to buy soap. While in the store, a detective was asking employees if they knew anything about the double murder from the night before, when he noticed Neil in the store. Neil, who was a known police informant, was approached and asked about the crime, but she had no idea. The officer gave her details about the crime and asked her to keep her ears open since a reward of $1,000 was being offered. When Neil and Miller returned to the laundromat, they spoke about the crime to Henyard, where he learned the mother involved survived the attack. When Henyard heard this detail, he spoke up stating he knew something about the crime. Neil offered to help Henyard in order for the two to collect the reward money, and he agreed. After leaving the laundromat, Henyard asked Neil to drive him by Alfonso Small's home, where he had a brief conversation with him, which no one overheard. After leaving his house, Henyard, unprompted, asked Neil to take him to the police station. Henyard told an officer that he witnessed the Lewis murders, but he didn't do it, so he was escorted back for further discussion. At first, Henyard was only a witness since he came voluntarily. He was questioned for three and a half hours. But the more he spoke, the more suspicions grew, that in some way he was responsible. According to Henyard's account, Manuel Yon and Alfonso Smalls picked him up in a blue Chrysler and the three went to a club. At the club, Yon and Smalls confessed to him they went to Winn-Dixie, stole the car, and shot the lady and her two kids. He claimed since he had no other way of getting home, he stayed with the two before driving everyone back home in the stolen car between 4.30 to 5 a.m. 
When Henyard explained his fingerprints would be in the car, investigators stated he could be considered an accessory to the crime, and he needed to do the right thing. Henyard explained this was him doing the right thing. He felt he needed to talk because his prints would be found in the car, and he was currently on probation. He kept providing greater details regarding the crime, which prompted suspicion. He was asked to take a polygraph test, which he declined unless his aunt could be present. With his detailed account and changing details, police decided to hold Henyard in custody. He was read his Miranda rights, which he confirmed he understood, and he waived his rights. During the second round of interrogation, the investigator noticed that Henyard's socks and shoes had blood spatters on them. The investigator announced, you even have blood on you, to which Henyard replied, how do you know that's not ketchup? At this point, it was obvious Henyard played a bigger part than he was claiming, so investigators pushed for the truth. Henyard finally recanted his first statement and said he was going to be completely honest. He explained he and Smalls were the ones who went to Winn-Dixie and abducted the Lewis family. He discussed everything including the assault and the attempted disarmament by Dorothy. However, he claimed during his struggle with her over the gun, he inadvertently shot her in the leg, but did admit to firing her three more times before dumping her and driving off. When it came to the girls, he claimed Smalls was the shooter and he stayed in the car. He only got out to help move the bodies. After his full statement, Henyard was officially charged with two counts of first-degree murder, one count of attempted murder, three counts of kidnapping, battery, and armed robbery. Smalls was arrested later the same day after being confronted by his mother. The night of the murders, he arrived home late with his pants torn. His mother questioned him about where he'd been, but he refused to speak. He went to bed that night and his mother, Annette Smalls, tried again in the morning. This time, he was willing to talk. He shared the timeline of events with her, but stated it was Henyard who forced him to do those things. It was Henyard who shot the family and forced Smalls to watch. He told his mother he attempted to get away from him, but Henyard threatened that he would be next. Annette called the police so her son could tell his side. As he was arrested, Annette told police, You all tied my hands. If you had let me deal with him my way, he wouldn't be where he is today. Annette was interviewed some time after the crimes, where she explained her son's problems started when they moved to Eustis the year prior. He started skipping the seventh grade, was suspended for hitting other kids, and continued fighting at home, where he allegedly tried to hit his mom. She called the police then as well. Mostly, she claimed her son's troubles on the older Henyard. Henyard was troubled too. His mother was in jail, his father kicked him out for stealing, his godmother who raised him had him arrested for stealing her car. He dropped out of vocational school in October and lived off girlfriends. His friends claimed he had no dreams or goals and made his cash by stealing purses. It was discovered even the gun used in the killings was stolen from a man he called his grandfather. When asked about the motive for the crimes, Smalls and Henyard claimed that Henyard wanted a car, so they got one. Prior to his trial, Richard Henyard attempted several angles to push the trial back. His first was through a motion to suppress his statements made during interrogation, stating he did not voluntarily waive his rights, and whatever extent he consented to, he subsequently revoked his consent. His motion to suppress was denied due to transcripts, video footage of his statement, and witnesses proving statements made were admissible. He voluntarily waived his rights and willingly gave the statements without persuasion and was not under duress at the time. On February 3, 1994, Henyard pushed for a change of venue due to the publicity of the case, which could affect the jury selection. But this too was denied. Henyard's trial started in May of 1994 and lasted for six days. The prosecution presented an overwhelming amount of evidence against Henyard, including a video confession, handful of witnesses, forensic evidence from the gunshot residue test, testimony from a blood spatter expert proving he was the gunman, and lastly, the most damning of all, Dorothy Lewis herself. The jury deliberated for a brief period before returning a verdict of guilty on all charges. They unanimously recommended Henyard be sentenced to death. On August 9, 1994, the state court upheld the jury's recommendation, sending him to death row. After his sentencing, Henyard tried to appeal his conviction, stating errors were made in his original trial by the court. But in December of 1994, his appeal was denied. The same month Henyard was sentenced, 
Smalls went on trial. Smalls was also found guilty by the jury, but due to his age at the time of the crime, he could not be sentenced to death. Instead, Smalls received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Manuel Yon, who provided clothes and concealed the murder weapon, was charged as an accessory to the crime. He was found guilty and sentenced to 11 months and 29 days in jail. On September 23, 2008, Richard Henyard was executed by lethal injection. He requested a last meal of two fried chicken breasts, turkey sausage, fried rice, chocolate chip cookies, and a Coke. He provided no final words. In 2019, Alfonso Smalls was given a resentencing hearing due to the Supreme Court ruling in Miller v. Alabama, which ruled juveniles given a life sentence without parole to be unconstitutional. Ultimately, Smalls was resentenced to a life in prison with the possibility of parole due to him failing to provide or demonstrate the ability to be a productive citizen or even a productive inmate. Smalls will be able to eventually request another sentence review and is currently incarcerated at the Hardy Correctional Institution in Florida. Dorothy Lewis couldn't see herself living past that day, but she has and has no plans to stop living for her or her daughters. Dorothy forgave Henyard and Smalls before Henyard's trial. She believed holding in all of that anger and hate only made her a bitter person, and she didn't want to live that way. She remarried 17 months after her daughter's funerals, but she kept the name Lewis to honor her girls. Dorothy and her second husband were blessed with a son of their own, who says his mother is his hero. She also found a passion for teaching elementary school. Along with being a teacher, she is also the co-pastor with her husband and their small community church. Dorothy occasionally speaks to churches and teens about that tragic night, but declines majority of the interview request, including Oprah. She released a memoir titled Unbroken, The Dorothy Lewis Story in April of 2011. Dorothy wants to encourage people to not give up, and that there's hope in situations that seem hopeless. She states in her book, God can get you through this. Hi friends, if you made it this far, thank you so much for listening. This case was really heartbreaking, but it was also inspirational. It's crazy to see someone who's suffered so much pull themselves from the trenches and just keep pushing forward. I appreciate Casey once again for sharing this with all of us. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, so leave them below and we can discuss this case. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving the video a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Thank you everyone for sending your love, support, ideas, suggestions, everything. I appreciate each and every one of you so much. I hope you have an awesome week ahead of you, but for now, Stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, friends.